Hey, this is Andrew DiMazio, and I'm the lead pastor here at Rose Church in Portland, Oregon, and this is our podcast. Our mission here at Rose is to be a home for humanity. Whoever you are, wherever you are, I pray today's message challenges you and encourages you in your walk with Jesus. Thanks so much for listening. Enjoy today's podcast. Rose Church, what's going on? I'm so excited to be with you guys today. Man, man, you have no idea. At this point, this is my third time speaking at Rose Church, and I'm just waiting, okay? I'm waiting for Pastor Andrew to just go ahead and announce that I'm that I'm like an unofficial, official, unofficial teaching pastor at Rose Church, all right? I'm so, so excited. And um, since this is my third time with you guys, I figured... Um, we're, let's go a little bit deeper than, than any of the other sermons. Not that my other sermons weren't deep, but I kind of want to teach a little bit more than I preach today. Now, I'm excited, and I'm black. Hello. So you already know I'm going to get excited. I'm going to get rowdy. I'm going to preach. But I want us to go to a couple of passages of scriptures. Like, typically, I deal with one passage, and we kind of d- just flush one idea out. But we've been in this series on the kingdom of heaven. And so I'm going to come right on the tail end of that. I'm, I'm, I, I'm just going to talk about the kingdom of heaven, and we're going to center our thoughts today around the fact that in order for the kingdom of God, in order for God's will to be done on the earth, it is going to take strong-willed individuals. That's right. Strong-willed Christians are the kind of people that are actually going to see the kingdom of heaven or the will of God done on the earth. Now, before we get into this, I, I always have to shout out how much I love your pastors, Pastor Andrew and Julia. You guys, I, I love you. You are so kind and so amazing to me and my wife, Tia. Uh, I honestly, I thought that like I had all the friends I needed. And then somewhere in 2019, along came Andrew and Julia. And you guys have been incredible friends to me and to Tia. And I love you. And I love the whole Rose Church crew. And man, I just honor you guys. I honor your leadership. And uh, even virtually, I would honor you in person. And so I honor you even though I'm talking across the airways. So uh, I just had to honor your pastors. And you should like be lighting up the chat. Like, yep, they're the best. Yep, we love Pastor Andrew, Pastor Julia. We, Yep, they're amazing because they are. And uh, God has given Rose Church an amazing gift uh, in my friends and an amazing gift to me. Um, I love preaching for you guys. And honestly, preaching for you guys is an extension of my friendship with Pastor Andrew and Julia. So anyway, all right, let's go. Uh, All right, we're going to, if you're writing down notes, I want you to write down this statement because it is going to be the defining statement of this sermon for today, for this Sunday's message. We are going to wrap our minds around the fact that if the kingdom of God, if the will of God is going to get done on the earth, then it is going to require some strong-willed people, some kind of people who, like Jacob, will say to the Lord, God, I will wrestle you all night long, and I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. The kind of people who've got the kind of faith that doesn't just... uh, uh, in just the kind of faith that responds to circumstances or gets discouraged easily. But the kind of people who have the kind of faith that are saying, no, come hell or high water, ups and downs. That's right. Through sickness and in health, the same way that I've made some covenant vows to my wife, I've made some covenant vows to the Lord. And I'm saying, God, I have vowed myself to see your kingdom come on the earth, not just in heaven, but I want heaven. As it is done in heaven, I want that to be done in Portland. As it is in heaven, I want that to be done wherever I am. So I want to take us to a passage where Jesus is demonstrating and teaching about the kingdom of heaven. And then in the middle of demonstrating and teaching about the kingdom of heaven, he teaches his disciples how to pray. And of course, he's demonstrating and he's teaching on the kingdom. And so his prayer says this. This is Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. If you're taking notes, you can write down. This is Matthew chapter 6, where Jesus is teaching the disciples how to pray. And since his central message is the kingdom of heaven, then of course, his prayer is going to include how we are going to bring the kingdom of heaven here on the earth. It says, uh, this then 
is how you should pray. I'm reading verse 9 of chapter 6 of the book of Matthew. This, then, is how you ought to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. So we start prayer with worship. That's good. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So Jesus says, hey, hey, I want, I, I want your prayer life to be a prayer life that is dedicated to seeing the kingdom of heaven happen. Not just in heaven, but whatever is in heaven, we want it to happen on the earth. So we know there's no cancer in heaven. So the moment we meet someone with cancer, what do we do? We ask that the kingdom of God would come and be present. That means healing would come. There's no poverty in heaven. There's no ghetto in heaven. There's no hood in heaven. So that means, God, we want your financial blessing to come on the earth. That's not prosperity gospel. That's just kingdom gospel. That's, God, we want the power of your kingdom. There's no injustice in heaven. Uh, so that means, God, we want earth to be a place where we have justice. Let streams of justice, let righteousness and justice flow like mighty streams, says the prophet, right? Whenever we see something on the earth that doesn't line up with what we know heaven is like or what we know Eden is like, then that's when we begin to grab the horns of the altar and we begin to pray and prophesy and believe that God's kingdom would come not just in some fanciful like fantasy world, no, but that his kingdom would come in reality, that communities would change, that people would be transformed. There's no depression in heaven. So we're saying, God, let your joy, let your kingdom that is full of joy be here on the earth. There's no anxiety anxiety in heaven. So God, we want your peace that surpasses all understanding to flood this room and to flood this community and to flood the neighborhoods that we live in. Why? Because we are the kind of Christians that are going to pray Matthew chapter 6 prayers, but then we are going to live Matthew chapter 6 lifestyles. And, and here we go. Here's the contention. Many of you may think, well, if it's God's will, then why doesn't God just go ahead and make it happen? And I think that's the sticky spot that a lot of us find ourselves in. We know that justice is the will of God and peace is the will of God and joy is the will of God. We know that poverty is not the will of God. We know that uh, all these things, we know that racism is not the will of God. We know that these things aren't God's will because they're not represented in heaven. But there's this tension between God, if it's your will, why don't you go ahead and make it happen? And here's the, here's the dirty little secret is that God says, well, I'm not the only free agent on the planet. Not only is God's will a part of this cosmic equation, but guess what? Humans have a will. And guess what? Satan has a will which means there are demonic forces that have a will, that the angelic hosts are morally free agents. They have a will. And come on, you and me, we have a will. And I don't know if you've ever babysat like a strong-willed child, like a kid who's just like, no. Like a kid who's like, yeah, I don't care what you say. I don't care how you try to coerce me. Like the answer is no. Like I'm just not going to do what you're asking me to do. And in the same way, typically, here we go, the enemy wants to corrupt that strong-willed nature that lives on the inside of us. Whereas God wants to use that strong-willed nature that's on the inside of us. And so a lot of us have to make this switch. Instead of saying yes to the enemy and using that stubbornness against God, we have to start saying no to the enemy and no to the desires of our flesh. And instead of being stubborn against God, be stubborn against the evil and the powers and the principalities that are at work in this present evil age. At some point, you're going to have to use that same stubbornness that you use to be disobedient and use that same stubbornness to what? bring God's kingdom to bear on the earth. In 
Parkland, at Rose Church, in your communities. At, at some point, that same stubbornness that was a curse for you, God says, no, 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 your stubbornness is not the problem. How you've used your stubbornness is actually the problem. And, and I believe that Jesus was stubborn. It's just that he wasn't stubborn towards God. He was stubborn towards the devil and towards his flesh. And at some point, you're going to realize that if the kingdom of God, if the will of God is going to be done on the earth as it is in heaven, then it's going to require some strong-willed people. Because although God has a will, God's will does not just magically happen. God's will requires some prayer warriors. God's will requires some people who are saying no to themselves. God's will requires some people who will fast, turn down their plates, fast from social media, fast from TV. That's right, fast from food. Go on a liquid fast. Oh yeah, God's will, God's will be done on the earth is always going to be in partnership with your will. So we have to ask ourselves the question, if God's will is dependent upon your will, then baby, how strong of a will do you really have in order to see the kingdom of God come on the earth? When you witness things that don't line up with your destiny or with the dreams that God has given you or what you know heaven is supposed to look like, what do you do? Now, we are going to look at two passages of scripture, both from the, the gospel. Since we are centering our talk today around the kingdom of heaven, we're going to look at two passages and, and we're going to talk about two women, two women. Uh, we're going to talk about a Canaanite woman who's not named. And then we're going to talk about a, Mar uh, a woman named Mary. That's right. Jesus' mama. And we're going to look at both of these women because both of these women uh, illustrate to me how we are supposed to have a strong will in order to bring God's will to bear on the earth. So we're going to stay in the book of Matthew, and I want you to go uh, to Matthew chapter 15. Matthew chapter 15. We're going to start reading in verse 21. Matthew chapter 15, verse 21. Uh, and before we even go to Matthew chapter 15, verse 21, I know maybe I'm the only person who struggles with this, but when I think about God's will, I sometimes get a little bit Calvinistic, okay? I'm not a Calvinist. I don't believe like everything's predestined, but sometimes the enemy sneaks into my thinking, into my theology, and whispers into my ear, whatever's going to happen is just going to happen. I can get a little bit fatalistic in my thinking sometimes. I don't know if you struggle with this. But I want to let you know, and I want to prove to you through the next two passages of Scripture, that God says, yep, I've got a will, but my will, the things that are going to happen, are not as fixed as you may think. That actually there's a lot of wiggle room when it comes to the will of God. At one point, God says to Moses, hey, I'm going to kill all the Israelites because they're wicked, and me and you just going to start over. And God and, and Moses prays to the Lord and says, God, far be it from you. Don't do this. Your glory, your reputation is at stake. And the Bible says this, that God repented, that God relented, that God changed his mind. At one point in 2 Kings chapter 20, I've got it pulled up on my, in my physical Bible, 2 Kings chapter 20, the prophet Isaiah goes to meet Hezekiah and he says to Hezekiah, who is sick, he says, hey, hey, you're going to die. Imagine being in the hospital and Pastor Andrew, Pastor Julius showing up at the hospital and you're thinking to yourself, oh, how nice, how kind. My pastors are here. And then they say, yeah, you're going to die. You know what I'm saying? You would not be that happy, right? Like, and, and Isaiah the prophet shows up to Hezekiah's sick bedside and he says, hey, you're going to die. And then Hezekiah is not taking that verdict for an answer. And so he begins to turn his face towards God and he begins to pray. He begins to decide, I'm going to have a strong will about this. I'm not just going to allow sickness to take me over or disease to run rampant in my body. No, no, no. I, instead of just accepting this as the final word, it ain't over till it's over. And Hezekiah begins to pray. And as Isaiah is leaving the palace, the Lord comes to Isaiah a second time and says this, hey, go back and tell Hezekiah that 
that I heard him, and then I'm going to add 15 years to his life. And so the prophet who said, thus saith the Lord, has to go back a second time and has to recant what he said the first time. Why? Because God's will has wiggle room. And sometimes the enemy will love to get into our minds and lie to us and let us know your prayers aren't going to make a difference. Your faith isn't going to make a difference. What you do isn't going to make, whatever's going to happen is going to happen. But I want to let you know that actually the kingdom is a little bit more like a choose your own adventure book than I think a lot of us are comfortable realizing. That God says that my will is actually dependent upon your will. So yes, I do need you to pray. Yes, I do need you to believe. Yes, I do need you to give. Yes, I do need you to volunteer and serve. Yes, I do. Because although I want to do the miraculous in Portland, unless I have people to partner with in Portland, then my will can't be done without your will what kind of God is this that would humble himself and limit himself to partnership with us but that is our destiny that is our calling that is why it is unique and special to be human because only humans have the kind of authority to bring God's will to bear on the earth and so no we're not just uh, Calvinistic in our thinking we're not just fatalistic we're not just doomed to accept whatever reality is present. No, we hear from heaven. We speak life into dead things. We, we look into the darkness and like our creator, we say, let there be light. Why? Because we understand that if the will of God, if the kingdom of heaven is going to be ushered into the earth, then it's going to come through our lips and through our prayers and through our thoughts and through our hands. We are the hands and the feet of Jesus, the body of Christ. And if the kingdom of heaven is going to be represented in Portland, then my will has to be laid on the altar. And like Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, I'm going to have to say, not my will, but your will be done. And I'll lay my stubbornness and I'll lay my pride and I'll lay my strong-willed nature on the altar and I'll say, God, I used to use this strong will to oppose your will in my life, but now I'll use this strong will to fight for your will in my season, in my life, in my community, wherever I am, wherever you've planted me, I'll use my strong-willed, stubborn nature to fight for you, not fight against you. All right, here we go. Now, all right, I'm in teaching mode. Uh, and I'm, this is me teaching. Yeah, I, I still kind of yell when I teach. But I'm in teaching mode, and I hope you're tracking with me. All right, okay, let's go. Uh, Matthew chapter 15. We're going to go for all, for all my, my, my AP Honors Christians, if you got a streamer, go ahead, go find Matthew chapter 15. We're not going to go back to Matthew chapter 6. We're going to stay in uh, the Gospels. We're going to go to Matthew chapter 15, verse 21, and then we're going to go to John chapter 2. So we're going to go to Matthew chapter 15, verse 21, and then we're going to go to John chapter 2. And Matthew chapter 15, it says this, leaving that place, Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon. So Jesus is not in Jerusalem. He's not in Israel, which means he's about to encounter people who are not ethnically Jewish. They are not racially Jewish. They're not ethnically Jewish. All right. Um, and this is going to be uh, prominent. This is going to be highlighted. A Canaanite woman. So someone who's not an Israelite, a Canaanite woman from that vicinity came to him crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is demon possessed and suffering terribly. Jesus did not answer a word. Uh-oh. So his disciples came to him and urged him, send her away, for she keeps crying out after us. I don't know if you read verse 23, uh, but Jesus did not answer a word. Jesus had his AirPods in that day, okay? Jesus does not answer this woman at all. The woman says the right thing. The woman comes humbly. The woman comes in praise. Just like Jesus taught his disciples to pray, Father, our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. The woman comes with that same attitude. Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is suffering, my daughter is demon possessed and suffering terribly. Jesus did not answer a word. And here we go. If you are going to be the kind of strong willed Christian who brings God's will and ushers God's kingdom into the earth, 
then I'm sorry, but being ignored by God just can't offend you that much. And there are some of us who are like, yeah, God, I tried the whole prayer thing, and I just didn't feel like you answered me. And imagine if Daniel in the Old Testament had said that. But, but, but finally, after 21 days, an angel appears to Daniel, and the angel says to Daniel, no, hey, Daniel, guess what? We heard you on day one, but I was in a spiritual battle. I, Michael, the archangel, I was fighting. No, well, actually, there's another angel that Daniel's talking to, and the angel says, I had to send for backup help, and Michael, the archangel, had to come fight the prince of Persia so that I could deliver this message to you. And sometimes we get in our little feelings. We get all hurt. We get all bent out of shape. Like I prayed. I didn't hear nothing. Like Jesus just ignoring me. And I want to help you because guess what? We can't approach Jesus with our feelings. We actually have to approach Jesus with our faith. And if your faith can't sustain Jesus not answering you right away, then you'll never fast and pray the 21 days to finally get the breakthrough. Imagine if Daniel had stopped fasting or stopped praying on day five or eight or 17 because of his attitude or because he wasn't heard or because God didn't answer. At some point, you got to get over yourself and realize even if I'm ignored, I'll keep asking. Even if God doesn't answer, I'm going to keep knocking. Even if I don't find what I'm looking for right away, I'm going to keep seeking. I have to come to grips with the fact that God is not always going to answer me right away, but that doesn't mean that God did not hear me. Jesus, here's the woman. And the Bible says Jesus don't say nothing. This is savage Jesus. Like, this is rude Jesus. You may not know nothing about this Jesus, okay? This is savage Jesus. And the disciples are like, hey, can you send her away? Because, I mean, clearly you don't want to talk to this woman. She keeps begging you to do what we are clearly not going to do. And can you just send her away? I love this because the woman does not stop. And where a lot of us would have lost out on what God wanted to do in our life, this woman kept banging on the doors of heaven because she just wasn't going to give up that easily. This woman had a strong will. Uh, Jesus doesn't answer. Then let's drop down to verse 24. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. Uh Uh-oh. So not only has Jesus not answered the woman, now Jesus makes it racial, makes it ethnic. Now, I don't know if you've ever seen an ethnic minority get offended because somebody made a slight or even a overt racial statement, but it ain't cute. Like, it ain't cute, okay? Uh, This woman, Jesus, is like, ah, you ain't even the right ethnicity, fam. Like, don't you know you got to be Jewish for me to even do the thing that you're asking me to do? You're a Canaanite. Like, you're not even the right ethnicity, now, see, for a lot of us, we, we, we can sustain being ignored. But at this point, this is when you would have stopped asking Jesus for what you were asking him for. This is when your will would have broken. This is the place where your faith would become what I call fragile. Uh, okay, that means fragile, okay? Fragile. Some of y'all, some of y'all, I'm not coming for you, I'm not, but I'm kind of family at this point, so yeah, I'm gonna step on some toes. For some of us, we got Ikea furniture faith, okay? We got Ikea furniture faith. We don't have strong-willed faith. We have Ikea furniture faith, and I wanna preach to your faith right now because I get it. Doubt has crept in. Fear has crept in. And sometimes the disappointments of life have a way of eating away at our faith, at eroding our faith. But we've got to be the kind of people who are like, no, no, no. Even if God doesn't answer me, I'm still going to believe. Even if God offends me, I'm still going to believe. Even if my pastor offends me, I'm still going to believe. Like, I'm just going to have faith no matter what happens. And for some of us, we got Ikea furniture faith, okay? Uh, Ikea furniture, I don't know if you've ever got anything from Ikea. My wife, for some reason, loves ordering things from Ikea. Then it takes me 15 hours to put the stuff together at the house. And, and, and the thing about Ikea furniture is that Ikea furniture is fine as long as you never move. But the moment you pack it up and put it in a box truck and move to a different location for some, somehow a dresser turns into breadcrumbs overnight. Some, I don't know how it happens. The stuff just disintegrates. And for some of you, you've got Ikea furniture faith. Your faith is strong as long as there are no problems in life. Your faith is strong as long as there's no opposition. Your faith is strong as long as there's no drama. But the moment, the moment you begin to try to believe God for his will to be done in your life 
or in the life of the people you love or in the life of your church or in the life of your community, the moment you face a little bit of spiritual attack or a little bit of opposition, your Ikea furniture turns into breadcrumbs. And I'm sorry, but you've got to get over yourself and start to get strong-willed faith. And I love this woman because Jesus is like, ain't you like the wrong race? And the woman is like, if you think that you ignoring me or offending me is going to make me leave this encounter with you without the exact thing that I approached you believing for, then you've got another thing coming, Jesus, because like Jacob, I will wrestle you all night long, and I will not let you go until you bless me. This is what the woman says. This is what the woman says. The woman came, and now she's kneeling before him. This is verse 25. Lord, help me, she said. He replied, it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the, uh, what? Toss it to the, what? Toss it to the, what? Toss it to, roof, roof, toss it to, roof, 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 toss it to the dogs. Jesus said, it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Okay, Jesus has ignored the woman. Jesus has offended the woman. And now Jesus called this woman a dog, a dog, a dog. You don't, you don't know about this, Jesus. You don't know about this. This is savage Jesus. This is grown man. This is not baby in the manger, Jesus. This is grown man, a lot of hair on his chest, like Jesus. This is rude Jesus. I wonder if you've ever encountered this Jesus. I've encountered this Jesus, the kind of Jesus who's trying to figure out how bad I want what I'm asking for. The kind of Jesus who's not saying no because it's not his will but he's saying no to challenge me in my level of faith. The kind of Jesus who's refusing me of my request, not because it's not his will, but the kind of Jesus who will refuse me of my request to see, will I come back the next day? And will I come back the next week? And will I come back the next month? And will I come back the next year? For some of you, Jesus has ignored you. Jesus has offended you. And you know what? Unfortunately, it has weeded you out. Out, which means you didn't even really want what you asked for that bad in the first place. If you're not willing to ask again, you didn't want it that bad. If you're not willing to fast and pray, you didn't want it that bad. If you're not willing to get a prayer partner and commit some time bombarding heaven with your prayers, then you didn't want it that bad. And at some point, Jesus is not just going to respond to all your petty requests. He is going to say no, not because it's not his will, but he's going to say no to test whether or not you've got the kind of will to partner with his will to bring the kingdom of heaven into the earth. I love this. Here we go. Jesus says, I can't give the children's bread to dogs. And I love this woman's response because for a lot of us, this is where Jesus would have got slapped. Okay, this is where, this is where Jesus, <laughs> Jesus would have got knocked out, okay, uh, uh, if he was talking to you. But this woman didn't approach Jesus with her feelings. She approached Jesus with her faith. And it says this. The woman came and knelt before him. Lord, help me. Jesus calls her a dog. And then verse 27. Yes, it is, Lord, she said. Even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus said to her, woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted, and her daughter was healed at that moment. For some of you, your daughter would have never got healed because Jesus ignoring you would have offended you. Jesus calling you a racial uh, slur would have offended you. Jesus calling you a dog would have offended you. But I want to help you because if you are going to be the kind of person to bring God's will, to, if you're going to partner God's will with you, your will, then you can't be a person that gets weeded out by Jesus being, ignore, being Jesus ignoring you or Jesus offending you. You can't get weeded out by any of these. You've got to look at these and say, no, 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 no. I've been walking with God long enough to know that there's a difference between what God said and what God means by what he said. Okay, I need an amen right there in the chat. I need an amen right here, right in the chat. I need an amen from all the husbands, okay, from all the husbands. Anyone who's married knows that there's a difference between what your wife says and what she means by what she says. Everybody knows this. Every, everybody knows that there is a 
cosmic difference between what your wife said and what she means by what she said. There's a big difference between when my wife says, yes, okay, and yes, okay. Those are very different statements. Yes, okay, and yes, okay. Those, those, those may sound, they sound like the same thing, but any, I've been married for six years. Uh, I was, I knew, I found this out after being married for six months, okay? It doesn't even take six months, six weeks to figure out. There's a difference between what your wife says and what she means by what she says. And for some of us, we can acknowledge that a wife or a spouse is complicated. However, we want to reduce the most complex, complicated being in the universe down to just say what you mean, God. No, God doesn't just always say what he means. At some point, the reason that you've got to be in church and you've got to like get an atmosphere of worship in your home and you've got to not just read your Bible on Sunday, but you've got to actually study this thing and so that you can discern the difference between what God says and what he means by what he says because this is the Jesus who will look at the Canaanite woman and ignore her, offend her, call her a racial slur, and then call her a dog. And then still ends up doing exactly what the woman requested that he does. Because what he says is very different than what he means by what he says. And for some of you, you've taken the first note. And come on, can we just be real? I'm talking to all the millennials. There's a lot, there's a spirit in us that just goes, eh, I mean, I tried. I, I tried. You know, that, and I'm sorry, but... That it's like the pathetic, kind of like God challenged you to, to believe for something, and then you tried, and it didn't work out, and you gave up, which is the equivalent of like, why did you even try in the first place? If you were going to try and give up, why even try? No, no, no. Like Yoda, there is no try. There's just do. Like, I, I will try and try again and try again and try again and try again. And even if God says, no, if I know that what I'm asking for lines up with his kingdom and his will, then like the persistent widow, I am going to believe and believe and believe and not stop. Why? Because I'm stubborn like that. All right, here we go. I got a couple of minutes minutes remaining. I hope this is helpful. If this is helping you, if this is helping you, let fire up that chat, okay? Fire up that chat and let me know. This is my third time preaching a rose. I'm being a little bit more of a teacher today than a preacher, and I hope this is like, I hope this is some open heart surgery, and now we're going to go to John chapter 2. I hope we're doing a little bit of open heart surgery, and if you're prepared, if you're like, okay, give me the next step, go ahead, go to John chapter 2. If you got a Bible, go ahead, flip to John chapter 2, because we're going to look at this encounter between Mary and her son, Jesus, because Mary has this same kind of bold, I will wrestle you all night long. I'm not going to let you go till you bless me, Canaanite kind of faith, this strong-willed faith, this stubborn faith, the kind of faith is just like, I will go to my grave believing for what God has said about me, about my family, about my community, about my church. Like, I just ain't going out like that. Like, I will go down swinging. Don't try me, okay? All right, let's go to John chapter 2. Let's go to John chapter 2. Uh, John chapter 2, uh, it says that Jesus' mother's there. This is John chapter 2, verse 2. On the third day, a wedding took place at Canaan, Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus said to his disciples, and Jesus and his disciples had been invited to the wedding, okay? When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, they have no more wine. Here we go, verse 4. Woman! First of all, I would have got knocked out right here. This is where I would have got knocked out because if I called my mother woman, I wouldn't have any teeth, okay? So I'd be the no teeth preacher, all right? Woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied, my hour has not yet come. So Mary comes to Jesus with a problem. Jesus, I need your help. Come over here. Come, Jesus, come here. Jesus, Jesus, come here. It's your mama, okay? I need a hookup, all right? Like, look, 
they done ran out of wine, okay, Jesus, and I need you. I know, I know what the angel told me when I was pregnant with you. Remember, the, I was a virgin. I know you special. You special. I know all these little mamas, they think they babies are special, but I know you is special. Jesus, you special. You special. And and I know you ain't done you ain't done no miracles yet, but today you about to do a miracle for me because I'm your mama. I'm, I'm getting a hookup today, okay? We ain't about to embarrass all these people. You know, rolled up here with all your disciples, and you brought that weird one. That weird one. I don't like him. You better listen to your mama. Something weird about that one. He's all in the corner staring at people. I don't know. What's his name? Judas? Yeah. Judas, that's his name. He weird, okay? You better get rid of him. He, don't be rolling with him. He going to do something weird one day. He going to betray you or something. I don't know. You better listen to your mama. Uh, but but Jesus, 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 your, your disciples are here. You, I don't know how you got a plus 12. Everybody else got a plus one. You got a plus 12. Rolled up in here with all your little disciples. Judas staring at everybody, being all weird. And I need Jesus. I need you. I need you to help. I need your help because these they, they about to run out of they about to run out of wine and and we can't have them getting embarrassed like that. I need you to do something. And Jesus says, "Woman, I, this ain't got nothing to do with me. This ain't my problem. This ain't none of my business. And my hour's not yet come." So Jesus effectively says no and gives Mary a reason. And I love this because we're gonna read the next verse because if Mary had a weak will. If Mary didn't understand the difference between what Jesus said and what he meant by what he said, then Mary would have politely taken her her seat at table number 14. But Mary doesn't just go back and take Jesus' no for an answer. Mary discerns the difference between what he said and what he meant by what he said. And Mary is like, oh, I got a stronger will than that. If you think I'm taking a no for an answer, you've got another thing coming. So what does Mary do? I love this. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Wait, 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 wait. Mary asked Jesus to do a miracle. Jesus says, nope. And Mary goes, okay, you wait right here. Hey, Pookie, Ray Ray, what y'all doing? Come here, come here. Y'all ain't doing nothing. Come here, Pookie, Ray Ray, this is my son Jesus. Yeah, we know Jesus, Mary. Okay, you're going to stand here. You're going to do whatever he tells you to do. Jesus is left in a socially awkward scenario. Jesus just got put. Jesus has said no, and his mama, his mama is preparing for a yes, even though what she heard was a no. Oh, I want to preach to you because, baby, if you hear a no, that means you better start preparing like God said yes. Baby, I want to help you because if you're Noah, you can't make it rain, but you know what you can do? You can build an ark so that just in in case it does rain, you are prepared for the miraculous move of God in your generation. Elijah, you can't make fire come down, but you know what you can do, Elijah? You can build an altar, and you can dig a trench, and you can pour water over it. Why? Because we cannot make God do anything, but we can set a stage and prepare for God to do what only God can do, and strong willed Christians know how to prepare for a yes, even when they heard a no. Oh, strong willed Christians, strong willed Christians are like, are like, are like single dudes who just ain't taking no for an answer. Oh, come on. This was me and Tia's testimony. Okay, this is me and Tia's testimony. I remember when I first met Tia, when I first, first met Tia, the first time I met her, I was like, oh, dang girl, you so chocolatey, you so cute, you so fine, just got black girl magic just emanating from all around her. She just had a halo, you know what I'm saying, of black girl magical good God goodness. Like, I just was like, mm. What's your name? Like, I, I need you in my life. And t- my wife was like, well, I got a boyfriend. But what I heard was, yeah, I still got a chance. You know what I'm saying? Like, like okay. I st- so, so, like, so when are we going out? Like, next week? Ne- are we going out next week? And she was like, did you just hear me? I said, I have a boyfriend. And I was like, oh, okay, so I got to wait, like, a month to go out with you? Like, when when you going to break up with him? Like, like at some point, like Mary, you've got to hear Jesus go, this ain't got nothing to do with me, and my hour has not yet come. And you'd be like, okay, cool, I'm going to find you some service, though. Because, like, just in case you decide to change your mind, I need to be prepared just in 
case. And I want to talk to all the millennials who want to play it safe. You've been called to walk by faith, not walk by life safe. You have not been called to walk by safe. You've been called to walk by faith. And at some point, if you are not taking risks with your life, then you are not living a kingdom of heaven lifestyle. I'm sorry, but we've got too many people who are too scared to build arcs. I'm telling you right now, I'd rather have an ark that I spent years building that never gets used than to be caught on the day of the flood in the middle of a miraculous move of God with no ark to get into. And a lot of us, guess what? If Jesus was at a wedding and you asked him for wine and he said, this ain't got nothing to do with me, my hour has not yet come, and, and you would have just went back to your table with this pathetic, uh, I mean, I tried, like, I... I but I, try, I tried, and God's looking at you like, I tried, just ain't good enough. I should be able to reject you, and you keep on pursuing me. What kind of will is God working with when he partners with us? At some point, you've got to get to the place like the Canaanite woman and like Mary who say, I know it sounds like what you're saying is uh, no. But I just so happen to believe that you're still going to do what I'm asking you to do because it's in line with your will for my life and for my family and for my church and for my city and for my community and for my state. I believe that what I'm asking is in accordance, is in alignment with your will. So I'm just going to stay flat footed and keep on believing what happens Come on, Rose Church, what happens? Jesus turns the water into wine. Ha! Huh. Because Mary didn't just take no for an answer. And so they got to see the miracle of God take place in their midst. They got to see heaven on earth. Why? Because one woman decided, I'm not taking no for an answer. Come on, what area of your life? Do you need to begin to declare, I'm not taking no for an answer. For me and Tia, that area is infertility. I've preached multiple times at your church. You know our story. We've been believing God for kids for four years now, going on five. And I remember when we were a year in, two years in, three years in, just believing God for babies, believing God for babies. At one point, I said to my wife, I said, hey, girl, I got a crazy idea. And she looked back at me and she said, you are preaching. You always got crazy ideas. And I said, I got, I got this crazy idea. I think we were living in this really cool apartment. We were living in an apartment that was perfect for, for us. It was, it was the right square footage just for me and her. We would have been comfortable. It was even a two-bedroom apartment. It was, it was great. It was awesome. It was cute. You know what I'm saying? And I said, babe, you know, we've been battling with infertility now for a while. And, and, and you know, if we're really believing that God is going to bring us children, why? Because children are a heritage from the Lord. That's right. Offspring, a reward from him. That's what the Bible says. So I know that my prayer for children is in line with God's will. So I said, baby, I know, I know that we're believing God for kids. But if we really believe God for kids, then we got to take a risk. We can't live in this apartment. The Bible says, stretch out your tent pegs, enlarge the place of your dwelling. So instead of believing God in this apartment, how about we buy a house that we cannot afford? How about we buy a house and put a baby room upstairs? How about we buy a crib? And I remember being in Target and being in Target. And there was a couple in Target with like an eight, nine month old baby. And I'm in Target. I'm buying a diaper disposals and I'm buying cribs and I'm buying all types of stuff. And they said, well, how old is your kid? And that was the moment where the enemy wanted me to get all awkward and, and back down from my position of faith. And I remember I looked this couple in their face and I said, hey, I don't have a kid yet. Actually, the doctors are saying that me and my wife are infertile, but I don't believe that we're infertile. I believe that I'm going to have to wrestle with this all night long until God blesses me. And I've got the kind of will that will prepare for a yes, even though doctors say no. And even though everything says no, I've got a crib upstairs and a house that's too big for me and my wife because
because I'm not just preaching to you. I'm living this out and I'm preaching to me while I'm preaching to you. If you really believe that God is going to move, then how about you prepare for the miraculous in your life? So what if the ark never gets used? I'd rather have an ark chilling in my backyard that never gets used than to get caught on the day of the flood with no ark to get into. For everyone who's playing it safe right now, how about you count the cost of what if, what if, what if God actually does what you need him to do? Are you prepared? Are you even ready to sustain The miraculous move of God. It's why I'm so proud of my friends Andrew and Julia because they looked at the space that they were meeting in and they went, if God answered our wildest prayers, this wouldn't be enough. It's cool right now, but I'm not just living for right now. God, as a New Testament believer, I'm supposed to be prophetic. And so they moved into a $2.5 million facility. Why? Because they were believing for the supernatural outpour of God in their life. How can you be a part of a church that is a living by faith, but you are living safe in your own personal life. No, the mantle that's on your church needs to be the mantle that you adopt as your personal testimony. I am going to be the kind of person that if there's an area where I have not prepared for the miraculous move of God, or if I've believed at a lesser level, I've got to stiffen up my back and I've got to believe God at the level of stubborn faith, the kind of faith that says, I will die believing God for children. You know why? Because right now, I and me and Tia, we have no kids, but I have faith. And I know people who have no kids and no faith. And to me, that's pathetic. Why would I have no kids and no faith? I should at least have faith. Good God, I'd rather have no kids and all of my faith than no kids and no faith. I will die believing. I will go to my grave believing that God is going to do the miraculous because that's what it looks like to be a strong-willed, stubborn believer. If God's will is going to partner with your will to bring his kingdom to bear in Portland, Oregon, you've got to begin to go, no, 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 no. I, I, I've got to start rethinking my faith. I've got to get stubborn with this. I've got to get strong-willed with this. And there are some things that God has promised me. There are some things that God has declared over my life. There are some things that God has promised this church. There are some things that God has declared over Portland. And I'm going to be the kind of person that stands in the gap and not on my watch Oh, not on my watch will we not see what God has declared in our generation. Now, I'm out of time, but I'm not out of sermon. You already know. I'm I'm always out of time before I'm out of sermon. I wish I could give this whole message to you, but I can't, which means this. You already know. Every time I preach to you guys, I write a devotional plan. Now, you can text the word crumb, C-R-U-M-B, because Jesus says, uh, it's not right for me to take the children's bread and give it to the dogs. And the woman says, yeah, but even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. That's what the Canaanite woman says. So I took that as the key word for this sermon, crumb, crumb, crumb. For some of you, guess what? <laughs> you don't need the whole meal. You're just declaring, God, I just need a crumb. I need a crumb. If I can get one more crumb of faith, <laughs> if I can just get a crumb, then God, it'll change everything about me. Text the word crumb. You can text the word crumb, C-R-U-M-B, to 97000, and you can receive a free devotional plan. Right now, me and my wife, we're still believing for children. We're still believing for children, still being faithful, doing what the doctors are saying. But guess what? The devil can't have my faith. The devil can't have my faith. And Satan, I hope you hear me right now. You can't have my faith. And I need you to say that in the chat right now. Devil, you can't have my faith. Devil, you can't have my faith. I'm going to be more strong willed than that. I want to see the chat lighten up. Devil, you can't have my faith. If you feel like the enemy has been trying to creep in with doubt, creep in with fear, and erode your faith, 
I need you to light up that chat. Devil, you can't have my faith. Satan, you can't have my faith. Enemy, you can't have my faith. I want you to write that in the chat as a prophetic declaration. Satan, you can't have my faith. You can't have my faith. If you walked in, if you, if you started watching this service today and your faith was waning, but you feel like your faith is rising, and how about you text the word crumb to 97000 and then get in the chat. And I want you to just make that declaration. Satan, you can't have my faith. Satan, you can't have my faith. I'm going to have strong faith. I'm going to be a strong-willed believer. And I'm going to bring the kingdom of heaven to bear on the earth. Let me pray for you. God, I thank you for my brothers and my sisters at Rose Church. No church like Rose Church. God, I thank you that you've knitted my heart together with Pastor Andrew. God, I ask that, um, that this sermon today would edify the believers at Rose Church. And God, I'm praying specifically, even for couples that may be struggling with the same thing me and T are struggling with. Uh, maybe not physically, but maybe spiritually, that there's something that they're trying to give birth to, that they're trying to give birth to the kingdom of God in their area of life, and they just feel barren. Not, it may not be physically barren. It may be spiritually barren. It may be barren in some other area of their life. God, we curse barrenness right now in Jesus' name. And God, give us the kind of faith like the Canaanite woman. God, give us the kind of faith like Mary. God, your word says that faith is a spiritual gift. So God, we ask that you would impart more of the gift of faith to the believers at Rose Church and for everyone who may be watching this in Jesus name I pray and we all say together amen come on we all type that out together amen 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 come on light it up in the chat amen 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 Rose Church I love you till next time peace Our ministry has been a blessing to you and all, whether through the podcast, through our live, or through socials, which you consider partnering with us financially to help us continue blessing people, reaching people with the gospel of Jesus. If you would like to do so, you can go online to rosechurch.org, or you can go online to our social page, and in the bio, there's a link to give. Thank you so much for considering and helping us continue with God's